The origin of the book is that I uh, was a student at UC Berkeley and I was very interested in radical politics. I, I wrote a paper on the American Black Panthers and stumbled upon a reference uh, to the Black Panthers in Israel. And, and it said that they represented the struggle of Mizrahi Jews, Jews from Middle Eastern countries, as opposed to Jews from Europe. And I thought to myself, wait, that's my family. My family's from Iraq. Uh, what is this all about? And I tried to Google it. And like, this was the internet of, you know, many years ago. And, and um, there was almost nothing about the Black Panthers online, certainly not in English. Uh, there was actually an erroneous reference to Angela Davis uh, inspiring the American Black Panthers or inspiring the Israeli Black Panthers on a visit to Jerusalem. But that didn't happen. And there's a funny story of how I figured out it didn't happen. But um, and I was, uh, you know, learning about the Israeli Black Panthers prompted me to want to know more about my own heritage and to start asking my father and grandfather about their experience in Israel. And meanwhile, I was becoming a journalist. Um, I went to work for a newspaper uh, in Israel, you know, a couple years out of college. And uh, I had a chance encounter a month into my into moving to Israel with a, a man named Ruven Abergel. And he was one of the founders of the Israeli Black Panthers. I'd heard of him. Uh, and we met and we talked. And uh, I, I told him I, I'd, I'd like to interview him. I didn't really know what, what it was going to be for, but it seemed like a good thing to do. And he, he jumped on an idea. He uh, didn't speak English and felt the lack of uh, language skills a lot in English prevented his story from being told more widely. He At one point, he described his conversations with me as uh, a feeling like smuggling a, a letter out of jail. Uh, he, Israel was like this prison the where the Mizrahi narrative wasn't able to escape. And, and now finally, through our work, it would, it would escape. And uh, I sat with him, you know, for 50 hours maybe in, in those years, um, not knowing exactly what I was going to do with it. And then meanwhile, in parallel, I was developing as a journalist and I fell in love with the concept of narrative nonfiction, uh, which is just is a fancy way to say that uh, you can write journalism like it appears in the newspaper or you can write it kind of like a novel where you have plot and scenes and dialogue and characters and and it makes the read a lot more uh, suspenseful and interesting. Um, and I decided that I'm going to try and write a book in this style about the Israeli Black Panthers. So once I decided to do that, the interviews with Ruven Abergil were incredibly valuable, but they were not enough. I had to go interview a lot of other people and I had to find people who'd never been interviewed by anyone before. And I had to go to archives. I went to about 12 different archives and I collected files that no one had seen before, including files in the United States uh, archives because the CIA at one point wrote a, a dossier on the um, Mizrahi issue in Israel. And the, I also found cables from the American embassy um, in Jerusalem uh, explaining what the turmoil was about the, um, about the Israeli Black Panthers and what it has to do with the American Panthers. And as we know from history, the American government had a, um, had a lot of activity around the Panthers and uh, were heavily involved in suppressing the Panthers. Um, so this extended to the role of the embassy in Jerusalem. Um, I also collected thousands of news articles that were written at the time, and, and I uh, painstakingly stitched together uh, this story that no one had really told in full before. There's uh, some you know, theater productions about the Panthers, some academic articles, but, but no one had chronicled them. And, and so even the the timeline of, of what they did, I had to establish um, from from scratch. Um, and, you know, so I, so I decided to write the story. I think that uh, one of the things we, we learned through the Panthers is that the, the way that Israel and Palestine are talked about as this dichotomy between Arab and Jew is, is, is oversimplified. Um, when, when Israel was founded, um, it was founded explicitly as a country uh, to be modeled after Europe uh, as a solution to the problems faced by Jews of Europe. And you had uh, in 1948, you had about a, a million Palestinians who were kicked out or, or fled. And 
in, in turn, soon after that, Israel imports about a million um, Jews from Arab countries. And those Jews come with a lot of the same culture of the Palestinians who'd left. The language is similar, the food, the customs, the family structures. And so this idea that Israel would create a European country, uh, well, that wasn't really going to work out anymore uh, because they had to contend with, with the, the Mizrahi Jews are coming in. And, and um, that led to a lot of tension and there was a lot of discrimination, both kind of in terms of condescending attitudes by the Ashkenazi European Jewish establishment towards the Mizrahi Jews and, um, and in policies that, that marginalized Mizrahi Jews in areas of education and housing and, and employment. Um, and the Panthers kind of came up in this system where they, uh, their, their families were kind of falling apart because of their experience of immigration to Israel. The parents were had come to him as Israel expecting to be treated as, as brothers and sisters, building a new nation together, but were not given an opportunity to contribute and were, and were treated in a way that, that they lost their honor and they lost their respect. Um, and these families were living 10 people to a room in dire conditions with, with in their neighborhood where the Panthers grew up. There was sewage running through the street. Um, they had... All of them had dropped out of school in elementary school. Um, their, mo their, their primary primary interaction with Israeli authorities was with the police that would come into the neighborhood and accuse uh, teenagers of, of stealing something or doing some crime and coming to beat them up. Um, and they live in this way and, and they, they, they're 20 years old now. They're out of juvenile institutions and they know their life is, is, is sucks. They're, they're referred to as street thugs. They have no no prospects, but they slowly learn um, through a series of historical uh, processes that, that the circumstances that leave them with no opportunities are actually not about them individually, but, but about something that's happening to their entire community. Um, and they learn that because uh, after 1967, Israel kind of is transformed. It, it goes from a country that that is uh, at war to a country that now has much bigger borders. Israel conquers a bunch of land. Jerusalem is very similar to Berlin, right? The Berlin Wall fell, and that was a historical event that, that changed everything. So when Jerusalem was split into East Jerusalem, which was controlled by Jordan, and West Jerusalem controlled by Israel, after 1967, there's only one city. The wall comes down, and the Panthers are no longer living in this neighborhood that is full of barbed wires and is right on the border, they're actually now in the center of Jerusalem. And the whole world comes rushing in. Um, that means people are coming in from other parts of Israel and from abroad, and ideas are rushing in. So rock and roll had the delayed entry to Israel, radical politics, the hippie movement. All that didn't come into Israel until after 67. And the Panthers are just perfectly positioned, the people who would become Panthers are perfectly positioned to receive this knowledge. And it's all very excited, exciting to them. Um, uh, you know, liberated ideas about sex, that's exciting to them. Rock and roll, Jimi Hendrix, they, they fall in love with that stuff. And they also start to interact with these people who from Europe and the United States and South America who come and teach them about these political movements that are going on. And, and so they learn about the Tupamaros in Uruguay. They learn about German movements. And even from Japan, um, some visitors come. And uh, the movement that kind of most excites them for various, for a couple reasons, is the American Black Panther Party. Part of it is because they realize how scared um, the Israeli establishment is of the Black Panthers. The, the news coverage at the time kept describing the American Black Panthers as anti-Semitic and, and due to their support for the Palestinian cause. And Golda Meir, um, the prime minister at the time, she was raised in the United States. So she's very aware of how explosive race, race issues can be. So she hates this idea of, of Israeli Black Panthers. And they're like, well, you hate it. That's why we're going to adopt it. And yes, we're going to, um, we're going to raise the Black Power fist and we're going to march. Um, now, a lot of you might be asking, uh, but are they black? Uh, you know, I'm Mizrahi, I'm, I, I'm not black, I, I'm, I'm a white guy. Um, and I'm lighter skinned than most Mizrahi people, but if, 
you have to transport yourself back to Israel of, of 1960s and, and 70s. Um, this is before Ethiopian Jews had arrived in large numbers. So you had the European Jews and, and the Middle Eastern Jews. And um, they're darker skinned. But not only that, they are discussed in the public discourse as being black. So I've talked to a lot of Mizrahi Jews who grew up in that era. And they remember the Ashkenazim would use a certain phrase um, to describe them. They called them Shvarze Chaya. And in Yiddish, that means black animal. So they were black in the racial dynamic of Israel at the time. Uh, and what they said was, this is a very interesting reclamation. Oh, you're calling us Shvarze Chaya? You're calling us black animals? Well, we're going to reclaim that. We're going to be black panthers and you're not going to like it. Um, so nowadays, uh, we, we, are, we can't apply our modern lens. We have to look at how it felt at the time to be a darker skinned Mizrahi Jew in Israel. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so they have this movement and they change Israel in all these ways that, that we're going to talk about um, in a campus event at Cal State Northridge. Um, and you should read about it in the book.